So last week, we got through talking about the Grusky weeding microclass model. To kick us off, Esri, how do you feel about taking the first one? Because my head is all mashed. I've been making a fence all day. Literally making a fence or just your normal job of making a fence? Well, <laughs> I would say I'm making an offensive fence. Fair point. Okay, so the Grusky Weeden microclass model. They identify three main causal mechanisms that generate these effects. One, allocation. Both select into an occupation by employers and self-selection by job seekers. Two, social conditioning, including education and training, interactional closure, higher density of repeated social interactions among people within an occupation and across that occupation, interest formation, and occupational environment, which generates specific lifestyles and social attributes. Third, institutionalization of conditions, formal licensing, employer protocols and defining jobs, and occupational association practices. The claim is that these processes operate more coherently and powerfully within occupationally defined microclasses than within the more aggregated categories of conventional class analysis. This means that conventional big class models will conceal a substantial portion of the structure at the site of production. Right. What do we make of that? The, like the claim? In terms of caught, like, you know, rating the causality of the claim. Like, yeah. Um, and, you know, just to flesh it out a little bit, what I think the, the effects in the, you know, that first sentence, I think is the, is the overall predictiveness of a microclass model. And this is their attempt to sort of like uh, iron it out. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in terms of that, I think that, you know, this is a lot more visible and obvious to people. That's why there's jokes about different types of professions and the types of people attracted to different types of professions or something like that. You don't see stand-up bits about like, ah, oh, the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie and the petite bourgeoisie walk into a bar. Like, I mean, I'm sure you do now for like, you know, really like micro, like defined. Yeah, I'm a hoshist comedian, you know. There's <laughs> 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 jokes here. Like, but yeah, but before that, sure. Yeah, or, or yeah, like jokes about, you know, like jokes about like doctor's handwriting and stuff like that, right? Like there's like a whole, but you know, the whole field of, right, comedy, like yeah. the history of stand-up comedy that's just oriented around people's professional class, you know, like a professional kind of status. That's how I knew I was meant to be a doctor. I've always had that handwriting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now I can, you know, not be dysphoric about it. I could just blame it on being a doctor. Yeah, it's just, it's or just a doctor right. in training. It's about being yeah. a doctoress. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, that we, we touched on last time about how, how these are way more predictive in a lot of categories, except in life outcomes, right? Some of the, like, one of the most important categories is, is more, it's more predictive to use a traditional big class analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think when you actually step back from the kind of political undertones of What's going on here? What the Gretzky Whedon kind of model is proposing is that when you zoom in and look at people's occupation, let's not call it class for now, let's just call it occupation, right? When you zoom in and look at people's occupation, which is a more specific category than big class categories, it's more predictive in most outcomes, right? That actually isn't that revelatory. It isn't that controversial. Of course, when you look at very specific occupations, it's going to be more predictive. And that's not even, that's, that's not bad either. That, that, that just makes sense. And of course it does. But when you call it microclass, it, it does a little bit of obfuscating. And I'm not even that opposed to, they're, they're, like, like White even says, like, I don't want to get into the debate about the terminology because there's interesting things being said here. And I actually agree with that. But just taking the Grusky Whedon model on its own without the without the interesting way Wright tries to integrate it, I do see it as a bit sus, I guess. Yeah, I, I think it all I guess it all 
depends. And I think it's what you're saying, sort of, you know, both of you are saying like, like what it is you want to do it for. And if you're, and, and what the level of analysis is, like, I think I mentioned a, a few weeks ago, right? Like what some of this argument reminded me of was like a lot of that kind of, you know, Bourdieu style field theory where Bourdieu was trying to claim and like Pierre Bourdieu, the sociologist trying to claim like the seventies, seventies and eighties, right? Like, oh, like how much more so than like, like your broad, your big class position, like how much, like what type of field you were in, you know, in like informed, like what you believed the type of cultural cat. Like, so for instance, like by field, he meant like, oh, like the journalistic field, right? Like journalists have a very specific type of, you know, cultural capital, sets of expertise, credentials, and so on. That's different than being like a medical doctor or someone's financial planner, even though all three of those could be considered members of the petit bourgeois or something like that. Right. Yeah. That, that um, could be deeply felt in a conversation between those three people. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, you think like a financial manager. Well, you know, you think like, a, you know, yeah, or the, think about the way, I mean, it's a bit flattening, but like the way people talk about like the phrase tech bros or something like that, mm-hmm, flatten, right. that flattens a lot of stuff, but it's like, oh, like, like it's, it's not necessarily like a coincidence. I would argue, for instance, that so many people in those professions gravitated towards a kind of like libertarian pseudo Austrian internalized understanding of currency and finance that brought them, that brought them towards crypto. Right. Even, even, even if they didn't think of themselves as right wing, even if they thought of themselves as liberal, right. Like there was a whole bunch of writing on that shit in like mm-hmm. the late nineties and, and thousands around these kind of like these kind of Marxist inflected critiques of like, mm-hmm. you know, Silicon Valley ideology. Right. There's that piece like, like, like Cameron and Barbara, like the, the California ideology. Oh, yeah, like, California yeah. ideology. Yeah. Like how is it that these people came to have this very specific set of kind of politics that was not universal, but very widespread. And so I think you do see stuff like that. Right. Like, but, but now how much it's, it's, it should be the, you know, whether or not the, maybe Grusky and Whedon are, are inflating the explanatory power of this, you know, I don't know, but there's something, there's something there. There's something interesting there. I don't know. Maybe it's just about finding the right context for it. Right. Because we we don't have to do as Gretzky and Whedon have have chosen for us, death of the author. Like we can even just do what Wright's doing and be like, yeah, I'm going to call this occupation because I don't want to call it class. But look how predictive and cool it is. I mean, the obvious thing for me is that if this is where the predictability is, this matches with with a kind of assumption that people have pretty differentiated worldviews, um, even if they're from like the same big class. And if you wanted to organize that big class, you'd have to participate in, you know, differentiated appeal. Like you have to be at least as good as appealing to people as advertisers. And you have to offer a lot more on the content realm, like than an advertiser possibly can. Like, and by content, I mean it in like the, you know, Aristotelian sense and not the like internet content sense. <laughs> yeah. But, well, yeah. I, I love, I love that you keep using differentiated appeal. And also I think the advertiser, the, the advertiser connection is, is interesting because like how it's similar and different. It's like, cause in a way, if you're like a leftist organizer, what you have to do is much more difficult than an advertiser because what an advertiser has to do you, or there, there, you know, some people, have, there, there used to be critical kind of Marxist inflected ideology right. critiques of advertising that used to argue like, you know, well, what advertisers really do is make you feel inferior about yourself or inferior about your status in the world, and then give you an extremely easy way out of that, like buying a product that can address those feelings of insecurity uh, about yourself that, that cannot possibly actually solve the problem that you have. Right. And therefore you'll always be open for buying another product. Whereas like, like if you're like an organizer or something, it's like, you have to, it's like, yeah, you need to like address the fact that, yeah, you're not, yeah, you're not very happy with the way your life is going, but, but then you have to get people to do something, stuff that's incredibly difficult. Well, right? Yeah, I mean, for, right. for an organizer, if you exact, if you act exactly like an advertiser, then, you know, you have another problem. Like you're a, you're a, you're selling people a dream, you're a huckster, you know, like. Right. The difference, I, I made a joke before about, about last time about, uh, you know, liking manipulation, right? But I think to me, yeah. it's more, I, what I actually re- kind of get at is the difference between persuasion and manipulation. Right. Yeah. Like you need to be able to persuade, you might you need to be able to persuade people, but you, you're not trying to manipulate them. And, you know, ideally the, I, but the best situation is one in which both parties or multiple parties are, are pers- trying to persuade each other and then coming to some kind of accord. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, what, about, about 10% of our 10 to 20% of our audience in their brain is like persuasion, manipulation. They feel the same to me. I don't understand the difference. Potato, and, tomato. Now you got to look out for those people, but for right. the, you know, the other 90, 80%, like, 
Stay tuned. So one one thing there is a the, that I find a little bit questionable is is the claim about like say the empirical evidence. To me, like I would say that that I would think that at certain times people act much more like a micro class, and certain times people act at a at a higher collective actor like you know like the like workers so you know and that can change with like the time in history in which the the empirical studies are done so that's just one thing you know i think i think it's yeah. a strong claim because I, I i would i would say that there are times when workers actually were act more in a kind of a worker class or bourgeois class than they would in their individual micro class you know i think we see this sometimes you know capitalists do it Sometimes they act more as a capitalist class than they do as their individual. Like, say, for example, certain sectors of capital might have done well out of Jeremy Corbyn, say, right? Uh, but, you know, if you're in the tree planting part of capitalism, you would have done well out of Jeremy Corbyn. But, like, as a, as a whole, the capitalist class would still have probably come together, even, even those as that were whole. probably... Yeah, as a whole, you're totally right. But it right. might have... Lehman Brothers wasn't willing to take one for the team or something, you know, they, they just got kicked up, kicked over. A lot of the other like sectors of capital were willing to play ball, but I think it's because there was an example made <laughs> of someone who didn't play ball. <laughs> I don't right. know if that's a, that's a little too specific, but um, yeah. So I'm trying to get at is, you know, like, so this would be like a, a thing I probably say a lot in this series, but is like, there is a kind of a lack of dynamism and a kind of a, a, a lack of, dealing with the temporal nature of some of the stuff, you know, the kind of a static kind of approach to some of the empirical. This is a problem with trying to do empirical stuff on this. But, you know, just I think it should be couched as a Marxist in, in more process language, if you know what I mean. Well, I think one important thing to point out about one thing you have to come into when you're reading about empirical stuff, you have to remember what the rules of generalizability actually mean. Right. So whatever empirical research Kresge and Whedon were doing only generalize to the populations that they sampled from at the time that they were sampled. And that's it. So, yes, it is in a specific time period. And if Kresge and Whedon are making claims about that are more universal than that, then they're wrong about those claims. Well, I mean, like, or, or at least it's unargued. Right. Or it's, this it's, is just something that if you're, when you're taught, when you're doing like empirical research, you're taught that like, you have to look at what this should generalize to and don't make an argument that overreaches that. So be conservative about how you generalize. And that's where the difference between, you know, empirical research versus like reporting on empirical, like popular reporting on empirical research kind of falls apart. Reporting will often make, this is just an example to illustrate my sure. point, reporting will often make something sound more universal than what the researchers actually planned. When you read a conclusion of like a decent empirical paper, what they are, they're often giving like a billion caveats and things that need to be studied further right. to like fill in the gaps, you know? And so I haven't read their empirical research, so maybe they are... Yeah, that's something that should be said. It's not like Wright presents all of the research and why it's so convincing. It's just uh, it's cited. It's cited, and 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 it jives. Really, you know, it it jives with my experience. So there's a resonance, and I and then there's also this whole rationalist layer of you can never have a, a class survey of every class. You know what I mean? Of every class relationship ever. And so for Marxists, they're trying to generalize about these things. You have to break from the empiricist realm at some point. And I think that's probably the underlying motivation for including something like this, is that if, if you don't break from the empiricist point and you say classes are really like what's out there, then you sort of lose the big classes in everyday life. Yeah. And if you allow for some rationalistic abstraction, then you don't lose the big classes in everyday life. And you can also have, can have some exactly. of your empiricist lunch too. You know, for free. Yeah. I can't remember where this was brought up, but the, the idea of going from the concrete to the abstract as being the real dialectical method. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, you go from the, uh, 
the concrete to the abstract, and then from the abstract back down to the concrete, you see? It's just something I heard a lot. When I, I feel like, like Rosa said that, but I don't know. It's, anyway, it's something I heard a lot in like you know Trotsky's Scientology circles. Like, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think the next slide actually. You know what happens when you make these slides? You know, a month or two ago, and then you get to talk about them. <laughs> then usually, the next slide answers the bullshit that you've just set out. So, Esri, do you want to take this one then? Ah, oh, fuck it. All right. So. Grusky and Whedon et al. have set out to empirically compare the explanatory power of big classes and microclasses, and to see how the relative strength of their effects has changed over time. There are two general results of importance from this work. One, microclasses generally have greater explanatory power than any of the models of big classes for a wide range of individual level outcomes. The only variables for which big class models do reasonably well relative to microclass models are those most closely connected to life chances, education, income, and wealth. Over the last several decades, there has been a general trend in the weakening of the effects of big classes, except for the associations of big classes with life chances. Whereas in general, there have been no such trends of diminishing effects for microclasses. The final conclusions of their investigations is that sociologists interested in the consequences of how people are located within a system of production <laughs> should devote their primary attention to occupationally defined microclasses rather than the traditional big classes. Right. So this is kind of answering my, my kind of point. So I think this is extremely interesting that as we see the working class as an organized class for itself dissipating, we see the the explanatory power of that class of the of the big classes diminishing like to me it seems to make a whole lot of sense yeah if you have a, like a level of quote you know post material or like you know just the level of you know material security that may be starting to fall apart with empty shelves so to speak like it does make sense that you have a proliferation of the causality of something more concrete, you know, closer to the nitty gritty of everyday life, the profession, the way the profession shapes the person. I mean, that makes sense. And then when you're dealing with, you know, life chances, it, this says education, income, and wealth. Wealth, I feel like is almost tautological because when you're talking about big classes, but I think like life chances also was connected to death and like life expectancy as well. I, I, I could be fudging that detail but i think i read that somewhere in this chapter and if that's the case then like yeah as soon as that like you know as soon as you get this like a few shocks to that material security you're going to start really noticing those stochastic life chances like how they distribute that's literally life and death stuff and can impact the way people look at stuff now just because it's causally related it doesn't mean that people are going to consciously be like, oh, of course, you know, this is the underlying universal class model and I'm, I'm, I'm class conscious now. <laughs> um, you know, they could, they could take it in a whole other direction and, you know, frequently people do, but it's a possibility right there. And if we are assuming that our, like, that our material security is going to get even more rocky over the coming decades, which I think we have ample reason to believe we should, then yeah, it is totally possible that the big classes will, will make a little more of a causal impact on people's behavior. Now, how that is going to be expressed remains to be seen. It could be that it makes more of a causal impact or could be, be that the life, the variables related to, to life chances become much more salient in people's lived experiences than they would be. The way It's similar to ways in which you know, when you look at China, when they started adopting like market mechanisms and capitalism, the standards of living for everyone in China increased, but then so did the income differences and life chances and the, the divide within the society get greater, right? Well, in, in our society, as as the bottom falls out and the people in the in the lower classes start to really feel a drop that those at the top aren't feeling, people are going to stop caring as much about all those other variables and start to really care about life chances. The only thing, though, 
is that the stuff that really shapes consciousness is more professional than big. And so this could easily be expressed in like a reactionary attack on these comfortable faggots in the Sorellian tradition. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it could well, totally go that way. <laughs> well, yeah. That's, yeah, like that will be the way it'll, that like that will be the that's, way. It's already happening. And it, yeah, like, exactly. Like, this, this, this pressure and this insecurity is like that stuff is already happening. And that's how capital yeah. works. You know, it, it needs the other to blame, you know, it was yeah. the gays in the 80s. Now it'll be trans people. You know, it was the Jews in the 30s, whatever. There, there well, needs to be that other that they can well, blame well, and, and push on. But more more than just the other, it's the a sort of like playing into a sort of like reactionary, like masculine chauvinism that's in the society generally. But, you know, if you're not like a prissy, well-educated person and you're exposed to violence on a regular basis, you know, there might not be like, this interpersonal kind of like assumption of safety. And so people just value, you know, masculinity more in those situations. And like, you have this like bunch of sheltered, and this is more, this is just like more of a class consciousness thing when these people are visible. Like if you live in a university town, so the townspeople are sometimes likely to like react to those university students much harsher than if you were in a, just a normal one of the mill American town or, you know, whatever. I don't know. It's it's not just an other, and it's not just uh, queerness or effeminacy, but it's it's the conflation, and you know, which is I think there's a material basis for it, <laughs> but it's also like it is, <laughs> you don't want this to come together this way. That it's the heroic working class man asserting you know the violence over the the queer bourgeoisie, <laughs> the effeminates. <laughs> Like, uh, be because it's kind of clear where this politics goes, and it, this this is the socialist root of fascism. <laughs> well, but and also, here's the thing, also, is it a point that that violence towards the the faggy, like white bourgeois guy in the in the wig, you know, like the old timey founding fathers? He wants him to be like <laughs> beat up that gay man, <laughs> fuck Washington, like. That's where, where your real enemy is. <laughs> well, I mean, well, and but isn't there's also a lot of work that goes in. I I feel like to to getting people to articulate and, and kind of misrecognize some of the causes of their frustrations and how the right. class system works. Right? Like this is like like this is like the right is very very good at that. Right? And even like the that growth of like the that kind of four channy alt right. Like mm -hmm. the Koch brothers figured out very very quickly. Like oh, we got to start funding some of these people. Right. Because like Dave, they like we got to start funding Dave Rubin. Right. Like we've got to start giving money to some of these these clowns and, and kind of integrating them because like they've tapped into something that seems to mix a, a weird combination of like class resentment and, mm -hmm. and all of this like social conservatism. And like we, we can we can move this in a place that's good for us. And if it goes in another direction, it's really bad for us. So it's like, you always like that. I mean, I guess this is where I kind of come back to persuasion and, and your discussion of differentiated yeah. appeals, right? Where it's just like, you know, like they're like the enemy or whatever is doing that shit all the time and they right. never stop. And they've got a lot of resources, <gasps> institutional networks, you know, they, they like they grow their organic intellectuals in a lab, basically, right? Like you could watch their, their trajectory. Um, and, and like, and like in my country, it's just like the amount of time that goes into trying to explain to like oil and gas workers, right? Like why like Greenpeace is the source of their frustration and not the company that's been like actually ripped them off for 30 years and like, you know, fucked with the tax rates to make sure they had no savings and like did all this sort of shit. So it's like, I, I think the thing is, it's like, like there'll be a reaction. I think like in times of like real uncertainty, you might get like big class positions might in fact have a lot of a uh, lot to do with with people's feelings of like destabilization because their life chances start becoming more important but that does not lead as you as you're saying you know to any specific outcome right it's actually like like i think ideology is pretty bad at getting people to think they're not getting screwed when they are but i think it's yeah, pretty I would, pretty I would, I would go as far to say that that's what ideology is like yeah I, that's I, right. I never use the word in a positive sense but, but it's, that, that's all went in good, Bob. But how does that explain the fact that Ben Shapiro's wife has a dry pussy? <laughs> I mean, there's certain things that only God can explain. <laughs> right? 
what, what, what were you getting at, Bob? <laughs> no, no, no so, simple, simply the idea that uh, there's a difference between ideology, like saying like, oh, ideology might be pre- might be very good at convincing people they're not getting screwed. But I actually think it's quite good at, it can be quite good at, you know, defining, like getting people to come to particular understandings of why that's happening and who's doing it to them. And like, and like that, I think is, is a big, like a big part of the right populist gambit. And I think it's, I think it's why the Koch brothers started funding people like Dave Rubin. Right. Right. That, that, that dark money is everywhere, man. That dark money is everywhere. Particularly, I think if you want to be a leftist who, who's really a rightist or is going to the right, there's big money out there to be made. Like there's always, always snakes in the grass and willing people to, to do that work. If you ask me, all those guys are like, yeah, it's, 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 it's so, everywhere. It's so morally like disparate though, because even people that shout about this 24 seven do it. Oftentimes people who are like the most obsessed with right. reading out right. the, the snakes in the grass are like instrumental in this way of thinking. If you look at like sports and you look at the sports stars who give out most about drug cheating, they're inevitably the ones that are doing it. <laughs> it nearly, for me, it's a rule of thumb. Like you just wait five years and they'll be caught. You know, Lance Armstrong and all these people. Where's my dark money? Oh, I need a I podcast. Would... You folks know what's up. I feel because I'm hearing some doth protest too much styles. You're all no, getting no, exactly. Oh, no, you you, you want to get on the on the G G payroll? I, I know someone. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, we've, we've legit got those. Like, hey, I'm a I'm a journalist from a, you know I, I don't know. We, we've gotten these emails from Swamp Site, and I've always been like, yeah, I don't know, fuck it. Like, sounds interesting, right? And Jake's like, I don't know, this is sus. So we're like, all right, so we don't do it. But you see, like I, in that morality tale, I'm not the I'm not the exemplar. I'm like, yeah, fuck it, why not? You know, just because, hey, <laughs> you know, let's let's explore. Sure, like who is this person? Let's get let's get let's have them on. Let's talk to them. And that kind of curiosity, which is maybe you know fundamental to a, like an egalitarian disposition or something, that could get you in trouble. That can get right. you in a lot of trouble just just by being in, interested and wanting to see what's out there, and you know, want like it. It's rather insidious. What um, I'm saying is I'm holding out for the IMF money. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking good luck with that. <laughs> How much could I get? Like got to stop all that interview, yeah. We've we, we got to start it, cashing in on our NATO shilling because, like, you know, I've been told on the internet that I'm, like, I'm obviously a stand for all these security agencies. And so I'm still waiting for my checks. I like, love it. There's, there's like, there's only two options anymore, right? You're either standing, you're either getting NATO money or you're getting Putin money. There's no one, no, no, there's no, there's no existence in between, right? I'm, Wait, you're on the NATO payroll? No, you babe, can't. I don't know if we could stay together. I'm, a, I'm on the G payroll. Uh, no, uh, it's no. okay. I'm, I'm transitioning to a third positionist, uh, far right uh, funder. Oh, so that perfect. I think will really kind yeah. of draw us. We're on the same side. Because, I'm, yeah. a, so I'm on the Victor. Or- I'm right. taking Victor Orban money. That's what I'm yeah, yeah. I don't doubt right. there's some Victor Orban money floating around. <laughs> oh, seriously, my, 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 yeah. my ex prime minister know. just uh, just congratulated his 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 free and fair election victory. So uh, oh, yeah. I don't know, maybe that guy's making some. Maybe, maybe Stephen Har- Prime Minister Stephen Harper was making some some uh, Orban money, some uh, G money. I don't know. There's Venezuela definitely- had way more legitimate elections for like decades and decades than Hungary does. <laughs> and america does okay let's keep it going i just wanted to talk about ben shapiro's right i know pussy no point to it (laughs) i think that was that was that a was that a deep fake no that was real that That was real it was just a cell it was a genuine (laughs) self-own yeah Yeah. unbelievable he didn't he didn't know that uh, an alternative state was possible this was this was big what like six months ago the whack ah, thing. probably a year ago. Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. Yeah. I, look, I, I think know. he said something else that made his marriage very, sound very desexual. Like, it was he, with that song. It was what wet ass pussy song by uh, some rappers. But I think yeah, he said my wife else is a gu- was like my wife is a was, is a gynecologist or something like that, and she thinks that she thinks that they're they're suffering from. Uh, uh, a yeast infection or something yeah. like that, and then people were just like, "Oh, you've told you're really telling on yourself." And then, and then, and then he, and then he, he was obnoxiously, as if there's any other way from the talk, reading out the lyrics like, "Can you believe this?" sort of thing, and then people right, did right, a right. cut of that as a remix of the song, right? And it was, it was pretty good remix, pretty good remix, yeah. Oh God, 
All right, fair right. enough. Tom, Tom, I'm, I'm as your friend. You should cut all this. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Tom, as your enemy, you should keep it in. Yes. Uh but like the thing is, that's maybe the first time ever that I've had internet lore that uh, Esri hasn't had. Am I right? It's yeah, usually I, always a one-way that's street. A fair point. I, I didn't know about the remix. I didn't know about that chop. That sound. That does sound like actually pretty dank in like the. In the Alex Jones like kind of remix category, I guess it, it was very much in that type of Alex Jones sings folk songs dankness. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. That's right, fun. Bob, do you want to take this slide? <laughs> yes, I would love to. All right, so yeah, uh, Wright thinks that the basic claims of micro class analysis are probably robust, like you know, like empirically, right? Micro classes uh, seem to explain variations across individuals and lifestyles tastes, and political and social attitudes better than more aggregate categories do, these big classes. So Wright is seeking to connect these results and arguments about microclasses to the central theoretical agenda in Marxist and Weberian currents of class analysis. And Wright proposes using the strategic context of political conflicts of Robert Alford and Roger Friedland to attempt this integration. Oh, yeah. This, we're approaching my favorite part of the book, probably. Right. There's one thing, like, I was thinking in, the, in one of the previous slides, I just thought, like, as an analogy. Like, I think if you were to, like, think about it, if we're, instead of looking at classes, we were to look at animals or birds, say, and if you're, like, you know, if you were to, wanting to predict the individual, like, actions of an individual bird species, you would, you would do a micro bird you know, species analysis to predict it. Does it nest in a tree on the ground? Is it flightless or blah, blah, blah. But like we have then, you know, the the, the general idea of what defines a bird. You know, that's just the way I think about these things. The microclass is obviously going to be better at predicting like, yeah, some of your po political or social attitudes. It just seems like to me a kind of something that we should all expect. If you want to understand the specifics of bird law, you would study bird law. Bird law. Just regular law. Well, you would study right. each bird's law. You would study sparrow law in particular if you wanted to understand how the law functions for sparrows. But don't get me started on bird law. Yes. You're killing me. This is really warming my heart. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's one of my, yeah. All right. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, we've broken down into a discussion of bird law. I never even thought of getting into micro bird law. That's like. That's Eric Olin Wright's like singular contribution to the legal theory of analytical Marxism. I mean, also, I think Danny DeVito's uh, singular contribution. You know? Yeah, he was the Communist Party chairman after Gramsci, right? Yeah, um, that's right. So, who are these? Uh, who are these? Roger Alford and Roger Friedland, please. Robert Alford and Roger Friedland, dudes. Man, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not familiar. <laughs> All right, I guess next slide. Let's find yeah, out. We can, <laughs> we can just go look. Should we just go like Wikipedia that? Like <laughs> a bunch of fucking amateurs? See, this is the joy of making the slides like a month ago. I have no idea what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Let me take this it, one then. It's it's either this or you're gonna get these lectures from specialists. Specialists mm -hmm. that have divergent <laughs> consciousness from you. Yes, a different species, perhaps. Oh god. Okay, Alfred and Friedland's typology of political struggles in capitalism. Alfred and Friedland developed a typology which included three different forms of power, using the metaphor of a game to illuminate the distinctions. So we have systemic power, struggles over what game should be played. Example is given as American football or basketball. It's so American-centric. God damn it. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hoorah. Hoorah. Just make it like, uh, if you just said like football or, yeah, you could have just said football, you know? It should really be like soccer or table tennis, really. They're probably the two most popular sports in the world, aren't they? How, how about foosball? That's popular around the world, right? That's yeah. true. Okay, so first we have systemic power. What game should we play? Then we have institutional power. Struggles over the room of a given game. Example, given change in rule to allow players to touch the rim of the hoop. That sounds very sexual. Which, which allowed dunking and added to the advantage of tall players. So for basketball... Yeah, <laughs> Touch the rim of the hoop. Um, rim of the hoop is another is, is another great Cardi B song. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Although it's not sopping wet. Oh, it could be sopping wet. Like in in, in Ireland, uh, your ass is called your hoop. 
Spe- especially in. Oh! <laughs> yeah, well, that's even better. That's even better. Okay. Yeah, so if somebody was to say "ask me hoop," it means like you know, kiss my ass or something like that. <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! I wow! I learned. Uh, well, I guess it's pretty shallow Irish Irish lore. It's probably something I would have learned my first day at Ireland, but I like it. Dublin slang is good. So situational power. So on the third, we have uh, situational power. So struggles over moves within a fixed set of rules. Okay, so an example. Players adopt specific training regimes and strategies within a fixed set of rules, which might exploit specific opportunities within the game. And these can kind of uh, amount to such an extent that they change the very nature of the game, such that rule changes are introduced to maintain the integrity of the game. So I just love these three. I, I love this these concepts of political struggles and capitalism. I think these are, I think this is an, an exceptionally clear way for us to think of as, you know, Marxists or socialists or commies or whatever we want to call ourselves about how we approach certain aspects of what we do. What do people think? Yeah, I love this. I mean, I'm a, I'm a hashtag gamer. And so <laughs> thinking about... All right. File the papers. <laughs> No, but like I love game. I do love games. I love you know thinking about making games and and stuff like that and the rules and game game design and stuff like that. So thinking about political struggles within capitalism or to overthrow capitalism, changing the, the actual game to be played really jives with me. And I think what I absolutely love about this chapter is more than just the beginning and the kind of explanation of microclasses. That alone, I probably wouldn't really care for this chapter that much. I wouldn't hate it, but it'd be like a nothing sandwich. But putting that into this typology, the way Wright does later on, is just so fascinating. It gives you a sort of like tier structure for how you can think of, I guess, a multi-level game that's being played or not being played, at, you know, depending on the historical case. This is what gives this model or this, you know, sort of macro model or whatever the fuck it is. This sort of view gives, it does give it an element of dynamism because you can talk about what elements of the game are in play. Right. It's yeah. That's important. Itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and as we've been discussing too, like those elements, these different elements, you can start thinking about like, when are they in play at different times and places? Can you start thinking about when one of those kind of elements of the game or choosing between games or playing within it are more likely to be in play at certain times than others, you know, like, so, so it's, it's actually, it cuts through a bit of noise, right? It also allows you, I think, to like kind of almost historically contextualize when even at the level of this kind of critical scholarship or whatever, when people, when certain approaches seem to be attractive, which is, which is one thing that, that I think Wright tries to do closer to the end of this, of this chapter. Yeah, totally. And this also really helps me kind of put, my life in like I applying this in, in, in my how I live my life in the day to day basis. Like for the most part, when I'm thinking about, oh, I need to I want to like go to nursing school so I could become a nurse practitioner. I'm in a situational power mode where I'm thinking of like, okay, what moves can I make within the given rules of the system? Am I going to do and then when I like kind of, you know, start talking about and fantasizing about like, what would it mean to run a candidate or maybe at some point in the future run myself, you know, as like a troll fucking Marxist candidate, I'm thinking maybe more institutional power, trying to fuck with the rules of the game. And then when I fantasize about even bigger dreams of like, you know, doing away with capitalism, I'm thinking in a more systemic power. And I have these conversations all throughout the day within the same day but it helps to kind of, it helps me feel like a whole person, you know? It's like, <laughs> when I was a baby, you know, little anarchist, I was like, oh, fuck the system. I can't think about doing good for myself because this whole system's corrupt. Right. But no, like, I'm just another person trying to live and make it to the world. So everyone thinks about what can I do to survive and live a comfortable life in this society, right? Unless you're a dumpster diving anarchist, like, but, but even ev- eventually. Even eventually. Like, someone has to think, do I have an alternative to this? Right. People Which is the best dumpster? Should should I prioritize over certain dumpsters? 
That, well, no, literally, though. Yes. What, what, what I meant is that people could be dumpster diving together for 10 years, but maybe one of them has an alternative to it, like kind of built into their life and the other doesn't. Right. And it'll, you know, say a lot more about them than those 10 years when it's all said and done. The interesting thing about the focus on situational power as like the entire, let's say, horizon of possible class analysis that I think Wright is identifying is like the extent to which it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a left wing version of like the end of history, right? Like a kind of like, oh, it's a particular, it's coming out of a moment in which no one can imagine changing the rules of the game, let alone uh, struggling over changing what game should be played, right? That it's, it's something that makes a certain amount of sense at a, at a particular a particular historical moment. And then the question becomes, is this still make sense? Like, are, 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 is this still, is it even still feasible to assume that you can keep all of your power within this sort of situational struggling over moves within the rules sort of thing? Because I think there's periods of time in which that seems to be the only game in town, you know, no pun intended. But then there's other times when keeping it at that level becomes suicidal, right? If, if, if you're on the left. So he, he's going to go on the next slide here. Sophia, you haven't done one yet, have you? No, I haven't. Politics and the social system game. Politics can be analogously understood as directed at different levels of the game we call a social system. One, revolutionary versus counter-revolutionary politics. Struggles over what game should be played. Two, reformist versus reactionary politics. Struggles over the rules of the game of capitalism, e.g. what kind of regulations, markets, sectors, etc. 3. Interest group politics. Struggles between social forces engaged in moves within a fixed set of rules over immediate interests, e.g. conflicts over spending priorities, tax rates, state subsidies, etc. The game of capitalism can be played under a wide variety of rules, which matter a lot to different players as they can confer significant advantages and disadvantages to the various players. Yeah, so there's a table here that kind of very nicely visualizes what I just read, but it adds another column for form of class analysis. So for the system level, what game to play, the form of class analysis that that, that is best suited for that level is a Marxist form of class analysis. And then at the institutional level, or using this metaphor, the rules of the game, a Weberian form of class analysis is most appropriate. And then at the situational level, which is focusing on what moves you can make with a given role set, a Durkheimian form of class analysis is most appropriate. And so maybe to refine our understanding a little bit, from before, because I mean, you have a really like good kind of sense of how this model can like include a human being <laughs> in class analysis, which is you know rather nice, uh, and you can situate yourself. But in the situational level, there is still like a sociological, like sort of you know greater interests than yourself as well. It, it right in this chapter says basically for a lot of like a lot of our politics is simply collapsed to this Durkheimian realm which can take the form of stuff like, you know, lobbying as we understand it mm -hmm. in, you know, Washington, that sort of stuff. And the kind of like, so it can describe rather big social interests, but it's, it's, it's much easier to see yourself in those social interests. In well, and I think also like when it comes to like lefty activist shit, right? Not even just left wing, but like people I run into in my day-to-day -day life and people I know throughout my life who are often sympathetic with my perspectives. They all are often very focused on, oh, but we still got to vote Democrat, vote blue no matter who, because they're stuck in this situational level and anything, talking anything beyond that, even trying to drastically change the institutional level, like once Bernie loses, they're just like, no, we can't really reform the rules of the game. We just have to you know, look out for certain special interests, special interests which do Im impact me personally, obviously. Like, even the worst Democrat tends to be better on LGBT rights than Republicans. But it's maddening that most people are so stuck in a situational level. Of course, we're never going to be, be able to move on beyond that. 
yeah, when like the the level of crises that we're about to face are at least at the institutional level, if not the systemic level. Yeah, and if, if we're really going to address climate change, it has to at least bare minimum be at the institutional level. And um, yeah, like or, or, the, or the even level I think of difficulty uh, uh, getting to the institutional level because for for you know American progressives or people you know prisoners of the American dream, people in this nationalistic bubble who, you know, the best they can hope for is, you know, people start interpreting the Constitution to be socialism, you know, like, <laughs> you know, people really hoping that they can just sort of change rules of the game until you ship a Theseus the whole game away, uh, which is more or less, I think, Eric Owen writes, like politics, you know, with respect. I think even, even without climate change, I think just the, like Western imperialism of its own power systems are, the, the rules in that are changing that I think will have effect of changing institutional levels of the game. I think I think that process is starting. And with climate yeah, change it, on top of it, like it it's does, fucking double whammy, man. It's massive. But it's like you can't do it through the prescribed mechanisms for doing it. There has to be some like unmitigated disaster that finally t- some, you know, pile of garbage that's been stacking up that finally collapses. And then people are like, oh, my God, this happened. And then you have some kind of executive snap decision <laughs> or something like you can't actually get it through the gridlock or whatever. Or if you do, it's I was you know. I was listening. I was listening to something. I think this is correct. That it, did FDR win the U.S. presidency with like eighty percent of the vote? I'm not familiar with those elections, actually. I think he won with eighty percent. You that know, sounds like that sounds reasonable. He, he, was, he was very popular, and that's that's like you know. I think like for you to get to be able to do anything in like the U.S. system, you probably need such a large majority, or you just need to take the fucking military and you know. Uh, I'm not even talking left or right wing. I'm just talking about to be able to break through the kind of you know the stagnant rules of the game. You know, this is this is a Republican like story and I'm you know, small R but like historical Republican like humanist tradition like you know Italians killing each other in sword duels over letters like and writing each other flashy epistolary like notes in hopes that history will notice them calling back to the Roman republics and, and stuff like when there becomes you know bureaucratic lard that you can't get through People start pining for some good old executive action. And, you know, this is part of the old humanist, like, fable of the undoing of republics. If you watch the the prequel trilogy of Star Wars, it's a, it's a you know, <laughs> sort, of, sort of contemporary take on that, maybe. <laughs> Where does Jar Jar Binks come into it? You know, Jar Jar Binks is, of course, the Vox Populi. No, Jar Jar Binks actually represents the Duke who supports the executive action that leads to the empire. Well, no, yeah, the Vox Populi. He thinks, so. okay, oh, so, yeah. so he, he's being tricked by the demagogue. Yeah. He's, you know, he's just this, this rube who's seeing the good in people and doesn't understand that this demagogue is going to destroy democracy. Fucking Jar Jar Binks. I'm not even him. kidding. That's the canon of Jar Jar Binks. Yeah. Like he, he supports he, Palpatine's expansion of executive power. Yeah, it's it's literally in, like a, a, a retelling of an old Republican tale. In, in fairness, though, Palpatine's, Pal, Palpatine's plan was very, very subtle. So it was hard to it see. It was very yeah. subtle. Yeah. It was hard he's to see it coming. Both sides, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because he's like, because they really doubled out on the anti Semitic stuff in the, <laughs> in the prequel trilogy, anyway. Um, hey, don't, don't forget there's a little, there's a little uh, xenophobic stuff in the, in the first one, too. Uh, oh, well, of course. Yeah. I've been, yeah. We've been, uh, we've been watching not... uh, Clo- Clone Wars. That stuff's just all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing a big plan in the back room, you stinking Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> there's an, even an alien with a huge nose that was rubbing his hands. Oh yeah! Oh my God! Yeah. Talking he, about he's like he's a financier. He's like you're a like, he was, he's a yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, tails is all the sign, people. I mean, makes the Ferengi look uh, woke by comparison. Well, I yes. went to watch um, Minions' yeah. new film with my with my kid on his birthday. Jesus Christ! Uh-oh. Minions. Have you watched this? No, but minion memes are. I've only seen the meme. Yeah. 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 Oh my God! It's like anti-Semitic, like. 
the main character is just obviously like just oh man and uh big nose you know evil schemer but they're trying to be on the side of him and then they also have all the minions who are small and they talk in kind of like mexican accents and they're happy to work for other people for no pay by the looks of it you know it's just it's huh. fucking grim well, the, the thing the thing that stands out about minions is the just following orders-ness of it. Yeah. Like, it's cheerfully following orders. Right. Of, like, someone who's evil. And they, but they talk problem. with a Mexican like, or sometimes a French mix, you know, wait, so they can... Really? Yeah. I've never seen a Minions film. I have no idea. I've, like, heard, like... I, I was maybe, shocked. Like, a minute of them talking my entire life. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of, like... Right? Animal, like, like no, they animal, actually like, use they, or like, but they use sort of Spanish like words. You're they actually me that, that, that they break out into like a Cheech Marin, like kind of. They basically <laughs> they do use Spanish words, and sometimes they'll use French words, but the majority of them are Spanish, and they talk to them fast and high, and you know they just want to work for their master, <laughs> no fucking pay. That's oh, why boomers love grim. minion memes so much. Well, well, I, I assumed it was reflecting the source material because it it just seemed so like in there. I yeah, like know. why would they gravitate towards it so much? Like, because I don't, I always thought that was so strange. I was just like, there's something like like those minion memes are so weird because they never seem to have much connection to the minion as pictured and like I've never, I never, there never really seems to be any allusion to the plot of one of those movies. Not that I guess <laughs> I would know. But there's always just like, oh yeah, some kind of like, some kind of like reactionary boomer received wisdom, right? That's just like yeah. uh, the the minion is on the screen. The minion is enough to get over to get over the idea that the that the accepted wisdom makes a certain amount of sense, right? Like all I all I know about the minion memes though is just because I'm on like the terrible Facebook meme subreddit where it's like where it's like eighty percent minion memes, right? And it's just like. <laughs> Nothing, and I'm just like, what the? F there's no real, there's no real connection to it, other than there's just a picture of a minion and then someone's awful fucking opinion. So now, <laughs> so now I'm like really curious, yeah, and some and and some relatively um, tame uh, fart jokes too. I think sometimes, yeah, yeah. Like check and, out, the pure check out of evil. The, the latest minions films. I, I I hate children's films. Like when I go to the cinema with my kid, I immediately fall asleep. I, I start snoring. It's it's embarrassing. I cannot stay awake. But I managed to watch a bit of this. I was probably asleep for half of it. And uh, but like it's actually quite funny, even though it's fucking you know just kind of anti-Semitic and racist. I can see yeah. why they're popular, right? But uh, so if you're interested, like in the memes, you should definitely watch one of the films because they're not. If you like if you like kids' films, this is like probably one of the better ones. Uh, what be what would you say is the height of the Minions or Despicable Me franchise? Oh fuck! I don't know. Like literally, you know. Yeah. Like, like, what's, I, the, like what's the what's the equivalent one. of Fast and the Furious Four? Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. The recent what, what's, one is... what, what's the Empire Strikes Back? Of the movie? Uh, I like how Bob goes to Fast and Furious Four. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, uh, the Rise of Gru. Can't oh shit! I meant five. Fuck! All right. Five. Yeah. Don't <laughs> take my don't, don't, don't take don't take away my, don't take away my podcast guest privileges for that yeah. oversight. <laughs> I've never seen any Fast and Furious. Would you recommend any of them? I would, but I love well put together action movies, and I feel like Fast and the Furious. It's like they're all terrible film, like they're all terrible yeah. films, but some of them are like competently done action movies, and yeah, those are really fun. Yeah. So, which which numbers are which? If we were to pick one, what would you go for? I like five through seven. I know some people do love Tokyo Drift, which, which also has its has its appeal for sure. But uh, is that an issue? Look, I'm not I'm not part of the fast community. Uh, it's weird. Like I, I don't drive. Like I don't have a car. But for some reason, I go <laughs> into those movies. And like, uh, yeah, I think like five through like like whenever when five when the rock seven. when the rock enters the franchise, it it I feel like it takes a nice boost. Um, although it's okay. funny because apparently Vin Diesel and the Rock are, are both such egomaniacs that they both have it written into their contract that you can't that that neither of them can lose a fist fight. So it's like if if you count out the the punches when they fight in Fast and Furious Five, which is a it's a really awesome scene. They land the exact same number of blows that because it was in their fucking contract. <laughs> so that's like situational level politics to bring it back, that right? 